Now, uh, I can tell you that it is a great privilege, uh, though somewhat intimidating, uh, for me to interest you, uh, introduce you and interest you, I don't I think I'll have any trouble doing that, introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Moira Gunn. Dr. Gunn is a former NASA engineer and scientist. She works now as an engineering consultant, specializing in technical management, technology reviews, systems testing, and robotics systems. If you don't feel insecure, I can assure you I do. Uh, most of you uh, have probably heard uh, her highly understandable uh, weekly NPR program called Tech Nation, Americans and Technology, which she produces and hosts. On this program, she chats with technology pioneers, futurists, and people like Jim Lovell, Edward Teller, and Sir Edmund Hillary. She renders their concepts intelligible to people like me. As someone who views myself as a cyber whiz because I know to say dot instead of period in stating an email mail address, this is most impressive. <laughs> Despite her rarefied credentials, however, I suspect that she has a very human side in that she has a patent on a computerized food intake measurement device, something I think I could probably use. <laughs> Dr. Gunn's visit to City Club today was organized by the club's highly vigorous Technology and Business Issues Committee through Sue Rich. <laughs> They're out there and they're dangerous, I can assure you. <laughs> Dr. Gunn has been asked to talk with us about how the internet can both create and destroy community. Please uh, join with me in welcoming Dr. Moira Gunn. Thank you, thank you for your very warm welcome. I have to say I'm just delighted to be invited by the City Club and I want to thank you. Uh, Oregon and Portland is some of my favorite places and I want to thank Oregon Public Broadcasting for running this show almost the minute we began syndicating it. I think they understood that technology's impact on our society today is one of the crucial issues of our time. And they not only ran the program, they ran it at a time when you could all listen to it and people, it was accessible to people. So we really appreciate their support. So how does the internet create and destroy community? Well, the first thing I had to say to myself is what is community? And I know it means something to the individual, to who they come in contact with, our families, all the families together, the entire mesh of every human interacting with every human. And it means community on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as for the occasional need or the emergency basis. So when do we have a sense of community? Well, community emerges when something bad happens or may happen. And I saw community driving in here yesterday on a seawall out here on the Willamette River. Today, we see this also in very small goods that happen, not just bad. A senior citizen gives the child next door an everyday grandparent. When someone volunteers to coach a team, when you join a fundraising effort for a library or a hospital or a school, it's in the sense of community that we know it. We can't weigh it, we can't measure it, but we know it when we see it. So how does the internet affect community? Well, it changes in, in how it changes who we come into contact with. Now before the telephone, we spoke to our next door neighbor. We hung our head out the window and said, hey, or it's who we happen to work with. And then after the telephone, our community enlarged. Families no longer bought houses next door. You could call your mother across town or your son at work. Uh, your friends could be anywhere. But you also had that emergency need. You could call the fire department, or you could call your son's teacher or your daughter's coach, or you could call the senior citizen across town who needed to get to the doctor. The telephone, like no technology before us, vastly changed community and our sense of community. Now, 30 years ago, the Department of Defense started the ARPANET. 
and it was to be designed, as any good defense, as a net that couldn't go down. And it's now 30 years. It's a net that cannot, be da cannot go down. Even if the government banned it, it cannot go down by design. And it's now, <laughs> it's now making its presence felt, just now, 30 years later, in our community. Our, all of our communities. In fact, one of the amazing things that happened this year to me is that my son's school is a worldwide website. <laughs> it just it absolutely astounded me at the beginning of the year. It's a grammar school and it's a worldwide website. And I said, gee, what does this mean? And nothing much happened for, oh, three or four months until one day I was driving the seventh grade uh, soccer team, one of the cars, to the soccer game. And I had all these seventh grade boys sitting in there. And the teacher, the English teacher, Mr. Spencer, was the coach of the team. And he, I happened to drive him. So he plops in the car, and off we go to drive to the game. And he said, oh, um, you know, I, I get up early and check my email messages on the website. And your son, Nathaniel, sent me an email at 1.30 this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm driving <laughs> car full of candy wrappers and boys <laughs> listening to this. And he, he wasn't alarmed at that. He said, of course, I get up early, so I was able to answer it. And he said, and Phil Meeker, his buddy, apparently was also up because he sent me an email at the same time. And they were both concerned that they didn't understand the assignment. He said, but I was able to send them the email, and they picked it up before school, and everything was all set by the time we started school today. <laughs> so I said, well, that's pretty interesting. I thought he was in his room sleeping. <laughs> so I had to, it takes me a while to dissect, what does that mean? What, what are we doing there? But the world is certainly changing, and the communications between those boys and each other, apparently they both got on the website, started chatting. They were both concerned about the same thing. The communication that they had with their teacher, how it rolled along, was much different than anything we could have imagined. That goes also when a child is sick. Uh, when you get into the later grades, you got to go down at 3 o'clock and pick up the homework. You don't just get to be sick. You got to go pick up the homework. Well, not anymore. It's on the website. Or you get an email, and there it is. You don't leave your home. Now, my children and, and many of their friends have access to the Internet through online services. And we all know them. America Online, CompuServe, Prodigy, The Well, Prime, that goes on and on. Everybody can each actually have their own service. And it's the internet, internet that allows these services to be connected. They all don't have to be on the same service. They can be on their own service, but they can communicate through that. They send each other email. They talk about the game last Tuesday or the game next Tuesday. They talk about their homework. They talk about girls. They have to go to a boys' school. <laughs> they talk about all these things. In fact, amazingly enough, Along came, in the email, a chain letter, an email letter. Well, my son uh, uses my business account on uh, one of these services to communicate. And of course, this one little boy in his class, right from about the first time he could write, which would be somewhere in the first or second grade, has about once a year sent us a chain letter. And uh, you know, one year it'd be baseball cards, and every year we say, this is illegal. You're not allowed to do these things, or they're foolish, or whatever. But no, mm -mm, it's not going to go any further. So this fellow, this little boy, was on a different online service. And he emailed, true to form, it to my son, who turned around and said, well, I'll just forward this to everybody else I know. Needless to say, my business online service account was canceled. This is illegal. <laughs> chain letters in any form, including electronically, electronic chain letters, are illegal. This is tantamount to your son driving your company car into a ditch the night before you're to leave on a business trip. It took two weeks to get it back. All of the messages that were out there had been deleted. And it is something that they experienced. Now, the experience brought home a number of things to my son and his friends, who really started to pay attention. And we could talk about all of those things. But the most significant thing that came out of it is they had the sense that Big Brother is watching what they're doing. 
if it's typed on the computer and they send it to each other, somebody else can, can do something about it. One of them had gotten thrown off a service for typing some interesting things into a chat room. They lost their account on that. And they know it's serious. The services don't easily give back these accounts. So they understand something at a very young age that, that we perhaps could only talk about philosophically. They get it. And of course, they also use the chat rooms. My son made a friend right up here in Portland. And of course, all these kids have an allowance of how many hours. You get so many free hours a month, I divvy it up between my two sons. And after those free hours, you pay for your hours. It comes right out of the rest of your money. And so I think that happens a lot with a lot of the kids on the internet. And they're all chatting with each other. Well, they know they have limited hours. So my son in San Francisco and his friend up here in Portland decided, well, we're both getting shy this month. Wouldn't it be better if we just called each other? <laughs> Two hours and $33 later, <laughs> my son learned quite a lesson. But he willingly went into his pocket and he, he paid it. And he began to understand the vicissitudes of life in that way. Now, he's a young teen. He was actually just turned teenage, became a teenager this week. And this is when they're just starting to get interested in, in girls and in relationships. And uh, this had gone on, this, this calling each other and writing each other and notes and this type of thing went on for four or five weeks of this last summer. And uh, finally, one day, the pictures arrived. And I came out of my room, our two rooms are kitty corner to each other, we face each other. And he came out of his door at the same time and I said, Ah, an envelope arrived for you. And he grasped the envelope and he clasped it to his breast. And he turned around and walked two steps in his room and shut the door behind him. I would have killed to get in that room. <laughs> I wanted to see that. Well, uh, nothing much happened. The door didn't open quickly, so I went about my business. And I came back later, and the door was open, and he was over on the computer, and he was just fine as day, tapping along. And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. So I went in, and I said, well, what happened? And he points, and there's a stack of pictures on the, on the desk. And I look, and I realize that this is a little girl that will never be in an ad. She'll never be a cheerleader. She'll never be anything like that. But she was his friend. So he said, Mom, I'm in trouble. I really wanted her to be my girlfriend. And it's not there. So I said, well, we're going to have to talk about this. What are you going to do? She doesn't need you to tell her what she looks like. And he said, yeah, we'll work on this. So off he went back, click, click, clicking. And about an hour later, the phone rang. And I said, hello. And he said, is Nat there? And I said, yes, may I ask who's calling? And she said, it's Jennifer from New Hampshire. <laughs> I said, men. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we seeing there? We're seeing the rites of passage that we usually see in a community, but we see it in a different way on the internet. And we see it in a way that is a lesson you don't usually see, and that is that he got to know this person before he knew what she looked like. He got to enjoy her and see their common interests and share and realize in reverse what usually happens. This brings me to child safety on the information superhighway. And before my children got on the internet, I'd done a number of shows. Um, one person that, that I, I enjoy talking to about it is a person called Larry Maggot, who you may know. He writes a syndicated column for the Los Angeles Times. And uh, he, ha he got invi involved with the Polly Klaus case and set up uh, a lot of the, uh, the connection now where over the internet, if someone is lost, we can, or if someone is missing, or there is anything, we can send it to all the kinkos. We can send it to many, many places very fast. And he wrote a pamphlet for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children called Child Safety on the Information Superhighway. Anyone can get it. Call their 800 number. And it's good as a parent to see that. But what really impressed me, frankly, is that uh, the kids have their own way of dealing with this. 
They say they don't want to talk to someone who's posed as someone else. They don't want to talk, they don't need a friend who's 25 years old or 60 years old that is posing as their teenage friend. Uh, and they, that's one of the reasons that they call each other, because they want to make sure that who they're talking to is a real parent, real person, and then they have their parents talk. And for all the instructions from all the adults that I've read and talked to and interviewed, I realized that they were as concerned as we were and they were taking responsibility. And I thought that was a very good sign. Now, you know, it's not just kids who are getting on the internet whose families can afford it. The American Library Association has a wonderful program now. They want everyone on the internet by the year 2000. And they believe in equity on the internet. A library used to be a place when you walked in, the person there was in charge of all the information in the building. That's no longer true. They can give you access to information all over the world for free. And that's what they believe is their mission. They call this a library without walls. And I, I, I said, you know, I, I have a little problem with that. Uh, a library without walls sound, sounds to me like you've lost even more funding <laughs> than you had before. <laughs> anyway, you get the picture as to what's happening. And it allows access, equal access, to everyone. And that includes the senior citizens. Senior citizens tend to be isolated. Their circle of friends tend to decrease. What they're able to do and their interests often decrease. And that's being reversed now through the internet. It is a way to find people who don't have to live near you, whether it's a block away or a nation away, to be friends with, to share what they're doing. And that's very, very important. Other people who are isolated can benefit. Uh, a very favorite person of mine is Dr. Felicity Hodder. She is director of oncology and hematology at the Children's Hospital of Orange County in Orange County, California. And what that means is she deals with young people who have cancer, babies up to late teenagers, young adults. And many times this may mean a transplant or a very serious operation. And when you come out of, for instance, a transplant situation, you are in a bubble. You have, you're completely sealed off. No germs, no viruses, nothing must go inside. And you might be in there for six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. And she devised a program to completely sterilize laptop computers and get them into the bubbles so that when they're in there, they can have access through the internet. So if they wake up at 3 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon, they can go out there and they can get in a chat room. And she said, you know, sometimes they go out there and they pretend they're healthy. They say, no, I'm just going to be a 16-year-old girl with nothing wrong with her. And other times they go out there and they say, this is who I am. Let me talk to other people with this same experience. And what she said, that we all know I think is true, that vision is part of healing. Both vision of what's happened to us and envisioning where we are going. And this is what she's doing with the internet. It's also very interesting that uh, she's also an example of where the internet can take us in terms of community. And that she had a problem. She had a boy who was really very sick and was really dependent on the internet, but there was a problem with his machine. And he, she had to get a new disk into it. And she had no way of doing it. She had always loaded up the equipment, had it ready for the patient, put the person in there, and that was it until it was time to come out. In this particular case, she needed to do something. So it was late at night, she was exhausted. She got on the internet into a chat room and she attracted perhaps 10 or 12 people, one of which was the CEO of a firm in Northern California. <laughs> she had some phenomenal people there. And all of them spent a couple of hours working on how do they get the disk into the bubble. And eventually, as Hoppins and teams, every single person made a contribution. They were able to hold the laptop up the, the boy in the bubble held it into the laminar flow, and they were able to get the disk in, hold it up there. He was able to download it. She was able to pop it out and get the information into the bubble that way. And that's a sense of community. All of us working together on a volunteer basis, working together for one of us, for all of us. 
Now, even so, I've even said to myself, you know, do I really need to get on the inter I don't have any time now. <laughs> you know, and I'm reminded of, of a story. A friend of mine is married to a fellow who, when she first dated him, uh, she didn't really know if uh, she really, you know, liked him all that much. So she gave him that old line, you've all heard it or delivered it. I just think we want to be friends. And uh, he looked at her and he said, friends? Friends? I have all the friends I need. <laughs> and that's how I felt. And when I spoke with Sherry Turkle, who wrote uh, Life on the Screen, she said, well, you may think you need all the friends, but until you need, and now I'm going to insert community, um, you may be limited. She gave me the example of a woman who had a, a child with a very special need, and uh, not so special that she needed an absolute school that was the answer, but she needed a very special school. And when she got on the internet within a few days, people that she never knew shared enough resources for her with her that she found a school that was perfect for her son. So this information over the internet enables us, human to human, to share in the collective wisdom of the community. And that's very important. Now, we have talked about uh, privacy, about, excuse me, about, about chat rooms and emails being monitored. And we're talking about now about privacy, about boundary issues, about you. Now, we all grew up with that business of um, a man's home is his castle. Now, that had to do with physical intrusion. That, had, that came before telephones. It came before any of the technology we have today. It's a boundary issue. You can't come in and search my home. You can't come in and tell me what to do in my home. With the internet and excuse me, with the internet and computers, we know your finances, we know your spending capacity, who you speak to, what you say, what TV you watch, your taste. We're just discovering what can be known about us. A man's home is not his castle today. A man's home is a sieve. Now, <laughs> ask Prince Charles about how it felt to have an intimate conversation recorded and played in public. And this is a man whose home is a castle. <laughs> I don't think it's all right. I really don't. I think it's what I call information terrorism, and I think we need to solve it. Just because we can have this intrusion doesn't mean we should. A gun can kill a person, but we have laws about killing people. It's not the technology, it's how it's used. And there's a relentless information intrusion in our lives today. Now, I have to spend a minute on, on cyber sex, uh, just because it's in the news. And uh, there was that recent accusation uh, that cyber sex was ta tantamount to adultery. Um, that, to me, is a little like talking about physical abuse and saying, well, if there's no bruise, there's no abuse. Or, or even more recently, well, there is no broken bone, so there's nothing to worry about. And, and we know the end of that story. Um, I don't think it's interesting to ask if cyber sex is adultery. I think there's a more important question, and that is when you decide to betray the intimacy of your primary relationship, then you've got a problem. And just even contemplating such an action should send you rushing to try to recover that primary relationship, because it's in mortal danger, and that's what's important to your society and to you. So, there are reminders of the internet everywhere. I went into, I was in Phoenix a few weeks ago and went into a sports bar with a whole group of people and here was their coaster. And it has both their email address and their website. <laughs> and an official uh, internet provider for them. So it's, it's everywhere. Uh, and I also am in sympathy for everyone who gets the bombardment of internet stories in the newspaper. So I went in a single day and I said, gee, what can I find in the newspaper that might be interesting? Now the first thing I found was one of those ads described as a column, a newspaper column. And you know it says, it says advertisement at the top. In fact, it's so little it says advertisement. <laughs> Has a headline. This one's great. Entrepreneurs discover the road to riches. Making money on the information superhighway may prove too easy. Entrepreneur nets over $100,000 a year. Says 24 hours a day, don't have to do anything, don't even need a computer. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the business page, 
uncertain times for online firms. Direct quote, for all the hype about the online world, almost no one is making money in it. So while you try to put those two together, um, you could just sort of throw in this one. Mickey Mouse now has a worldwide website. So like, how do you put all that together? Well, I don't know. <laughs> well, we have good news, and we have treacherous waters. Uh, but that doesn't ask, answer the second part of the question. It's like, can the internet actually destroy community? And I can see the headlines now. Small town in Texas destroyed by the internet. <laughs> we thought it was hail, but no, it was the internet. <laughs> I think it's more we don't know yet. It's too early to tell what we can lose because we're all not on it. We don't know what's going to go away because so much of what was here is still here. And we don't know that we're going to lose anything, that we're not going to get more. Now, uh, I don't know how many are familiar with Sherry Turkle's book. She's from MIT. It's called Life on the Screen, Identity in the Age of the Internet. And I'd like to read a very short passage from it. It says, every era constructs its own metaphors for psychological well-being. Not so long ago, stability was socially valued and culturally reinforced. Rigid gender roles, repetitive labor, the expectation of being in one kind of job, or remaining in one town over a lifetime. All of this made consistency central to definitions of health. But these stable social worlds have broken down. In our time, health is described in terms of fluidity rather than stability. What matters most now is the ability to adapt and change to new jobs, new career directions, new gender roles, new technology. I think we have a key here. The vision of community we must have needs to be independent of the times in which we live. Then we won't react to new technologies as corks bobbing on the water. We can be more like a ship steering wisely through rolling waves. We can't predict the weather or the seas, but we surely will make home. Thank you very much. I warn you at the start that I've been accused of being a Luddite and a technophobe because I worry a lot about some of the losses um, associated with new technologies. I do worry about the loss of local community because people are so busy in front of their screens they don't uh, communicate or interact with the people around them. You were saying that we don't know what the losses might be. My question is, do you think our society will ever come to a point when a new technology is introduced where we can thoughtfully consider what the gains and losses might be and then go about employing that in a very thoughtful, careful way rather than just going kind of full bore with it and then later on realizing that we overdid it? No. <laughs> 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 Let's look at how it happens. <laughs> this is how it happens. The way new technologies come into our society at this point uh, is not that, for instance, the government is funding it and controlling them. They're happening all over the place simultaneously and they are being introduced as part of a business proposition and as part of our capitalist economy. And quite often, even if we can sit there at the beginning and say, okay, let's carefully consider this, we don't know what it's going to be like until we start to experience it. So we can't, we can't, it's in the experiencing of it that we understand what's wrong with it. We can take a certain amount of responsibility as we go forward. I think that um, uh, certainly, uh, I think it, it, it would be nice if we could do that, and I think we shouldn't just abandon it. I think what we should do is begin to develop rules of ethics for introducing things into the environment. I don't think that we should, uh, I think an example might be when we have online services, if that was to be new tomorrow, and we knew the kids could get in, that we work with such organizations as the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children right up front. And we 
try to develop guidelines, understanding that we could be wrong about what we're saying, and then and understand that we could develop it. So I think that the, that uh, social responsibility and technology needs to be addressed. And I think that as a community, we can come to expect it. Uh, and I think that all of us in our, in our buying choices uh, can respect that and cause it to occur in how our society works. Hi, I'm John Ross, uh, co-chair of the Vigorous Business and Technology Issues Committee. And uh, we're delighted to have you here today. Thanks Thank for you. coming. My question is, uh, ties into the RAND Corporation study that came out in November, where if I understood them correctly, they said that universal access to email is going to be fundamental. It's going to be crucial to the survival of democracy, not only in our country, but in the world. Uh, maybe I'm stretching their conclusion, but my question is, What's the most effective model that you've seen for getting internet universal access out there? Uh, and do you think that function is going to be a private or a public sector uh, function, both in the United States and all around the world? Um, I'd like to distinguish between the United States and the rest of the world. Um, we're fond in the United States of saying, all over the world, the internet, and all these people all over the world, once you cross the border of the United States, you see far less internet interaction and online services than you see here. It's, it's quite different. Some countries it's easier, some it's not. Um, but the level here in the United States is far greater than anywhere else. How do I see universal um, access to the internet? Uh, I like the library model. I never met a librarian I didn't like. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> it's that simple. And libraries exist in communities. Now, they may get federal funding and state funding and foundation funding uh, and community support, but they're primarily in the communities. And they're placed, the decisions about them are placed in the communities. And so I like that model, that you can walk in off the street and did it, do that. I uh, attended a meeting of a, an organization called Ecom Northwest, which is just starting up here. It's sort of like a chamber of commerce for uh, electronic commerce uh, in uh, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, BC, that sort of whole area. And uh, one of the speakers there uh, had a, has a very uh, uh, thriving business uh, on the internet, and he first got on the internet and learned about it at the Seattle Public Library. And I said, I like that. I like that a lot. You don't have to buy a computer and an online service or any of that. So I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Chris Smith, City Club member. Um, as a marketing manager at Tektronix, about a year ago, I had to adapt and change when Webmaster got added to my list of responsibilities. Uh, and at about the same time, I became webmaster for uh, a local theater, Artist Repertory Theater. And my question is about the difference in my experience between the two. At Tech, we look at the internet as a way of actually saving costs and communicating with our customers in a lower cost manner and providing better service. At the theater, it was very different. We had to go ask one internet provider for free web page hosting and an another one for free email access. And, Finally, we had to write a check for uh, domain name registration because nobody would donate that. And each decision was very difficult. Can we justify this? Uh, the library model may give individuals access. What can we do about nonprofit institutions that would like to use the internet as a way to expand their mission, uh, but don't necessarily have the funding to do that? Would all people with large trust funds and executive directors of foundations please raise their hand now? <laughs> That's how we do it. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's, uh, it's, it's the same problem. And uh, I think we do understand about email and browsing. And before long, we're going to understand the, 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 the creativity involved of making every school a website and, and going on. And by the time we make every school a website, there'll be two more technologies out there that they don't have. So we just know that it's the lag behind. And if we keep pushing, we'll keep following on at the standard distance. Carol Turner, City Club member. 
Um, I'm beginning to use email. I haven't gotten up my courage yet to go into a chat room or any of that. But what I'm observing with email is there's something unique about the communication that occurs there that makes me vaguely uncomfortable. And you talk about forming a community and not, say, seeing someone and getting the unique experience of getting to know someone without seeing them. On the other hand, I mean, there's a breaking down of barriers that calls for immediate chattiness that um, you don't discuss the weather, potentially, with that other person that you're communicating with. And uh, it's just, it's very curious to me, and I'm interested in your comment about the unique type of communication that's occurring in this field. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I think that every time uh, in San Francisco that I've talked on the telephone with anyone up here in the last three weeks, we've always talked about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, that people talk about shared experiences and they talk about experience, experiences so that they may be shared. Um, I don't, I think that it adds on to the relationship that you can have. And uh, I think it opens up venues for talking about things that you might not be able to do otherwise. And, uh, and I think I'll probably have a different answer 10 years from now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Walt Roberts, City Club member. Um, I have friends who are working on what the practice and art of conversation uh, uh, online is, uh, especially around creating learning organizations where, where knowledge and team and you know, growing is an important part. And he's doing it in the private sector. Anyway, it, it, thinking about his work and just thinking about how we do things in a face-to-face -face way, the deliberative back and forth conversational debate, forums, uh, democracy, deliberative democracy. So it, there's a, it takes on a quality in a face-to-face in a, in a city, in a town, and then, you know, then there's online conversing and what's the art and practice there. So I'm wondering if you have some observations, some things you could say about what you see about, you know, the implications of the differences between an online con conversational art and practice compared to the face-to-face, -face, and is sure. there a tearing there, or is there a coming together there, are there parallels? Okay, let's all pretend we're a chat room. You guys are all observing this, and this gentleman just typed everything he just said, and you had to read it. It would take a lot longer for him to type and read than to say. And then I typed and read. You had to read what I had to say. It's about a three to one to five to one ratio in terms of calendar time. So that's one of the reasons why face-to-face uh, -face is better. Um, besides the fact that you're actually seeing the person and you're getting feels, and you're getting signals. They may be typing words, but it's like their body language is, I hate it, and their words are, I love it. Um, so, you know, <laughs> it's a little tough to, to get that. Um, but it does say that if you're in, in Portland and you have someone you're working with very closely in Washington, D.C., and uh, you don't have to get on a plane every week and spend all week in Washington, D.C. Maybe you can do it every other week or two days a week. And that allows you to have the rest of your life. So I think that there's, it's not a substitute. It's just one other way of doing things that we fit into the total picture. Actually, Paula, I do want to say something else to you along the Luddite line as I'm thinking of it here. And that is, I think we want to distinguish between uh, Luddites and technophobes. And we have to understand that roughly 40% of us are technophobic. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't use it or you don't get into it, but it means at some level, at least with certain technologies, if not with all, you go through these sort of self-harassing things. I hate this. I don't want to learn about it. Why does it have to be here? I'm going to, you know, oh, I hate it. Your heart rate goes up. Paul is going, <laughs> your heart rate goes up. You break out in a sweat. You might be fine in a car, but terrible on a computer. This is independent of your ability to successfully use them and to incorporate it well in your life. And I think uh, a number of people who think that they are Luddites might, in fact, just be experiencing technophobia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Marty Crouch, a City Club member. 
You alluded to how it is that the internet has a culture of its own, starting with the ARPANET and then expansion into universities. And it seemed like the culture is one of fierce independence and one of avoiding promotion, hype, and marketing. I'm wondering how you see the culture of the internet changing and what it will be like in the future. Well, the internet, of course, started with that defense, Department of Defense project, the ARPANET, and when it was first sort of introduced in general and the first people on were primarily techies, and, and many of them were students. A lot of it happened at universities and uh, undergraduates and graduate students, and of course, they have that sort of uh, everything should be free and you should be able to do anything you want and, you know, and, and it's time to go cash the check from my parents. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it's really been only recently with the proliferation of computers, the proliferation of modems, all that technology that's converged together and figuring out how, how to use it, that businesses have been able to use it. And now that they're starting to use it, a whole new world is emerging. Uh, for instance, Yahoo, uh, which is an online service started by two uh, Stanford graduate students who still walk around in t-shirts and, and jeans with holes in them, but managed to get venture capital. <laughs> and their business cards say, Chief Yahoo. <laughs> and I said, well, how are you going to make money on this? Because it was free. All these people log on and get information for free. And they say, well, the, the, the venture capitalist people keep asking us how that's going to be. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but now get this, you know, we're used to advertising, we're used to this type of thing. What Yahoo has done is because you can search on different keywords, is it's selling the keywords. So Bud, Budweiser, I guess Anheuser-Busch Budweiser, has bought the keyword beer. So if you get onto Yahoo and you say, what do you know about beer? What websites and, and places can I go with beer? As it's coming up, you see Budweiser. Now, how many words are there in the English language, and <laughs> how many times can you sell them? I'd say that that's a pretty interesting way uh, of that these kind of things are going to be evolving, how to make money, what the structure is. Some things will leap ahead and, and really get there. Some won't. Some will fall by the wayside. So that's, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Hi, I'm Tim Bakke. I'm also one of the members of the more uh, verbose Business and Technology Committee. Uh, I, I wanted to, there are so many topics that, that the internet brings up, and perhaps we should have a Usenet group to discuss them further, but um, one of the things that is really becoming painfully obvious is the role of responsibilities, um, where responsibility lies. If it is a parental responsibility, if it is a commercial responsibility, or if it is a governmental responsibility. And I'll be curious on your uh, particular viewpoints on this subject. Um, I would say that r currently my viewpoints on this subject are just forming. And uh, the reason is, as I mentioned some of my concerns about, uh, about the information intrusion in our lives. Uh, I don't know, uh, but I do know that uh, parental responsibility is still parental responsibility. You don't abdicate that or you have trouble. That's your parent and you have to look at everything and decide. That doesn't mean you control. Certainly when the baby is born, you're 100% in charge. And at age 18, you don't say, now it's your turn. <laughs> it's between one and the other, there's this exchange. You're making good decisions for yourself and this kind of thing. And eventually it, the, the shift occurs over time. Uh, the government, uh, the government responsibility and controls very much concerns me. It concerns me in a number of ways, um, including Big Brother, although I've never been, uh, that's never really struck me. It strikes the heart of many people, but it doesn't really strike me. What I'm really concerned about are two things. Number one, all of the people in the, the Congress and the, and the Senate, um, they know so little about technology. How are they going to make good decisions? 
Secondly, I look at the kinds of laws that have gone on around technology and how we have to learn how not to hook it to the technology that's there. I think a very good example is the adaptation of, or the dictate that we would have airbags in automobiles. Everyone said, here, here. Well, by the time that came around, we had other technology that actually would be safer for you than the airbags, but the dictate said airbags. So the law or the, the instruction needed to read that you need to have at least these minimum safety standards in this way, however you meet it, including airbags, so that when we got to this point forcing them to move in that direction, they had, a, they had something else that could benefit society. Very tricky. So that's, that's where I'm thinking here. Hi, uh, I'm Neil McBurnett. I'm also on the Tech Biz Committee. And, and first of all, just wanted to say for local community-minded people, there's going to be another breakfast forum sponsored by Tech Biz on local civic networking. You know, the business community is doing a great job of uh, putting their own material up online, but w we are trying to have more coordination in the uh, government and nonprofit sectors, and there's a lot of exciting things going on there. So look, look for that. Um, I, I, the thing that I wanted to ask about is, is anonymity. Um, I've been involved in online communities for a long time, and I observe that people are sometimes less socially minded when they feel the anonymity that is so easy to come by online. And much though I support and I'm excited by some of the technologies to protect my privacy, which is another huge um, aspect of this, I see a lot of antisocial behavior because anonymity is so easy to come by. And I just wonder if you have thoughts along those lines. Uh, I agree with you. I, uh, I really dislike antisocial behavior. I, I uh, you know, went to college in the late 60s and in the early 70s, and we, you know, we were like, oh, we're equal rights and women's lib and all of that. And that really was really great until that first day I woke up and realized I was pregnant and I was going to have the baby. I wasn't going to get to say, now it's 50% your turn. And so there are realities to life. Um, I think that also I appreciate in those days when we were going through all the equal, 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 that um, the rules of social etiquette that came down to us were not just imbued with rigid gender roles that we opposed, but they had to do with courtesy and how we treat each other and how what we say affects other people. And we've kind of forgotten that. And I think that, that uh, as a parent, and certainly as an individual, I think that none of us should tolerate that kind of behavior. And if we're going to uh, uh, go over the uh, online services for dirty words, I would say sort of antisocial behavior should throw you off as well. I'm Marty Ringel, Director of Computing at Reed College. Um, I noticed that uh, with only one exception, everybody that's come up to the microphone has been a male. And you just brought up the issue of gender roles. I wonder uh, if you can tell us what you think the impact of the internet will have on gender roles. Well, I sh in many ways, I don't know. I do know that 97% uh, or 96% of the people in the <laughs> chat rooms. <laughs> well, bravo. I'll get this answer over with quick so we can get to her. No. <laughs> I do know that uh, the great deal of the people in the chat rooms are male, even if they're telling you they're female. Um, and <laughs> I think there's a whole lot of guys out there, you know, just, oh, well, never mind. And uh, uh, if I were to look at, say, my son's age, uh, it's more like 25% female to 75% male. Uh, and I don't know why. Uh, but uh, uh, it, I think that. Uh, in general, we are not going to have, uh, we're going to see how that develops. I don't know what it's going to do. There are some services out there like Women's Wire and things like that. But you can get a lot of that information anyway. You know, just women have too much work to do. I don't know if you guys knew that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. Uh, Terry Bristol, member. 
Hi, I've been talking to Moira. She, which, who we've invited to be in the Science Technology Society Lecture Series next year. Hope she comes. I will. I will. Yes. <clears throat> um, uh, it's kind of relating back to your answer to Paul's question is like, can we plan and think and, and, and uh, structure uh, a technological revolution like this? And I, and I very much agree with your answer, which is just no. And, <clears throat> but what's interesting about it, the sense I'm getting is a real frontier sense of what's going on here. I feel like I get my power book and I get on a plane and I'm traveling to another country and with my you know, cell phone and stuff, you know, it's like a six gun. I mean, and I'm out there in the world. and and America is spreading out and this culture is spreading out and technology, country, people are saying countries are becoming less important. I mean, nations talking about government, well, who's the government? Depends on where you are. Uh, depends on who's protecting you, UN. I mean, there's a, it's a revolution in the, in the global community here that's coming about that's, that's driven by this technology that's very exciting. It's very scary, but I think it's exciting. I have some thoughts on that. Yes. <laughs> These are easy questions. <laughs> no, yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Wendy Bean, and I'm a member. I'm also a member of the Technology and Business Committee. So I, I wanted to. Uh, Bravo. I wanted to represent the females in the group out here. I would agree with you. I would say with most women. There's just not time. <laughs> I know my husband gets upset at me for all the time I spend on the computer. I, I am in an interesting position in that I'm a computer instructor at Portland Community College, and I am teaching a class in HTML over the internet. I've got students in Holland and Singapore and Portland, Maine, and the British Isles, and it's it's opening this whole new world of education. My question to you would be, where do you see education going with the internet? Um, you know, for years we've been hearing about how the computer is going to take over the classroom, and we won't need these teachers, and you know, we don't have to have union contracts and things. Um, humans teach humans. They teach them by example. They teach them by word. They even teach them by building some of these systems. and. Uh, every teacher I ever knew had to look into the face of the student and didn't look at the test, but looked in the face of the student and said, did you really get this? <laughs> now, I think it will be interesting. Um, I don't know whether you're teaching adults or children or, or teenagers or whatever. There's going to have to be a way over the internet to figure out if they got it. And that's the essence of teaching. A human shares with another human through what other vehicle. Um, I do think that we'll find effective ways to do it, and we'll find things that can be taught that way and things that maybe don't, can't be taught very well that way, like watercolor maybe, or maybe, maybe so. Maybe we'll have visuals, or maybe we'll be able to see the person's picture and reaction. Uh, but it will be another way, and it means that you don't have to be in the same place at the same time to do it. And that's marvelous. We have time for one last question, if you're very quick. Sorry, Ray. Uh, Joella Worland, club member. Uh, give us some idea of whether you believe we're going to be um, calling up the internet on television-style monitors very soon, or will we be continue to be sitting at computers? And or how soon do you see this beginning to come together from what you're learning about it? Um, I'm seeing uh, very quickly, I'm seeing cable people getting into the market. I'm seeing a lot of people getting in with uh, non-computers that kind of look like television sets. I would say look around your house and look how many television sets there are. Uh, in all likelihood, we'll probably come through them. I think that there's a great race on, and we don't know who's going to win yet. Thank you very much, Dr. Dunn. That was wonderful. I think uh, as I pick up my email this evening, I'll be lots more cautious, but after that, I'm getting in the hot tub. We stand adjourned. Thank you.